This is the feast of the Holy Family here in Phoenix, Arizona. The epistle is taken from St. Paul's letter to the Colossians, chapter 3. Brethren, put on as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, a heart of mercy and kindness, humility, meekness, patience. Bear with one another and forgive one another if anyone has a grievance against any other. Even as the Lord has forgiven you, so also do you forgive. But above all these things have charity, which is the bond of perfection. And may the peace of Christ reign in your hearts. Unto that peace indeed you were called in one body. Show yourselves thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you abundantly. In all wisdom teach and admonish one another by psalms, hymns, and spiritual canticles, singing in your hearts to God by His grace. Whatever you do, in word or in work, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father, through Jesus Christ our Lord. The Holy Gospel. Taken from St. Luke chapter 2. When Jesus was twelve years old, they went up to Jerusalem according to the custom of the feast. And after they had fulfilled the days when they were returning, the boy, Jesus, remained in Jerusalem, and his parents did not know it. But thinking that he was in the caravan, they had come a day's journey before it occurred to them to look for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And not finding him, they returned to Jerusalem in search of him. And it came to pass after three days that they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who were listening to him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when they saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why hast thou done so to us? Behold, in sorrow thy father and I have been seeking thee. And he said to them, How is it that you sought me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? And they did not understand the word that he spoke to them. And he went down with them, and came to Nazareth, and was subject to them. And his mother kept all these things carefully in her heart. And Jesus advanced in wisdom and age and grace before God and men. Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. By way of announcement, <clears throat> We see the, the wisdom of Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre. He really set for us the guardrails and the blueprint to follow in this terrible time of the apostasy, in this time of the crisis of the church, when we see Rome gripped in darkness of Vatican Council II with all its heresies and errors. And there's a horrible new mass that's taking many souls to hell and the whole conciliar church with all its heresies of ecumenism, religious liberty, collegiality, and all its uh, errors. It's making Catholics lose their faith and it's taking many, 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 many souls, innumerable amount of souls to hell. Because, just one example, in the whole text of Vatican II, the word supernatural does not exist. It just doesn't exist. So without the supernatural, we cannot save our soul. Uh, the whole faith is supernatural. It's revealed by God. So we see the wisdom of Archbishop Lefebvre in his guardrail. He, he, he said, <clears throat> among the many things he said, he said... We must neither be modernist nor schismatic or celebicantist. Ni modernist ni schismatic. And he said, when it comes to matters of faith, 
when it comes, especially the spirit of the church is with regard to Episcopal elections and the sacraments, we must always take the tutsior pars, we say in moral theology. You always take the, the tutsior pars, which means the safest position. So if there's any doubt, for example, of uh, a, a, an ordination or Episcopal consecration or the validity of a sacrament, you stay away. And that's why Archbishop Lefebvre, his practice was with confirmation, for example, done by the new right, by the modernist bishops, the new right of confirmation has been so changed that it puts the sacrament in doubt. And that's why Archbishop Lefebvre's practice was, anyone who was confirmed in the Novice Ordo, let them be reconfirmed conditionally, which means if you're not confirmed, you will be with the traditional sacrament of confirmation. This is very important, because obviously the devil wants to strike the Catholic Church right at the roots, cut the life, the source of grace, which is the sacraments. And once you change the Mass, and you change the words of consecration, you've got a doubtful thing. It may be valid, if it's a valid priest, with the proper matter, form, and intention, but maybe not. Maybe not. And so anything doubtful you stay away from. Anything doubtful you stay away from. And that goes with the sacraments, that goes also with bishops and elections of bishops. So in a very, great, in a very short nutshell, we just see how wise Archbishop Lefebvre really was to guide us with stay with Catholic tradition, stay with priests who hold the faith, and wait and pray and persevere and rebuild until Rome comes back to Catholic tradition. Now, uh, all of you, I'm sure, are aware with the whole, the whole uh, question of Bishop Ambrose. And I ask your prayers for him. He's a very likable man. However, when one studies the documents, the photographs, the history... It's, it's swimming in all kinds of question marks. And I'm not a detective, I'm not a moral, I'm not a, a canon lawyer. But all I can say, there's enough, there's enough there to say, stay away. Stay away. So, I have told Father Pfeiffer, respectfully, that if within a week, there is no public disassociation from Bishop Ambrose. I will be obliged to leave with Our Lady Mount Carmel in Kentucky. So, I've consulted with canon lawyers. I've consulted with fellow priests. Everyone unanimously says, flee. Don't go with that direction. Because of the Greek, the uh, schismatic orthodox consecrations, which by canon law, there's a punishment. There's a suspension for being being uh, for a Catholic man to go seek to be consecrated by an orthodox schismatic is a punishment of suspension. And if they do it in good faith, it's up to uh, Rome to determine when they will resume their use of the sacraments. It can be valid, but it's illegitimate. And I know we're in this time of crisis. And so if they profess the faith, that's a good thing for them. But with this case, it's swimming in such contradictions and doubts, and it's anyone who looks deep into the case, you're just swimming in question marks. So, Archbishop Lefebvre, I, I go back to him again. He's our guide here. If it's not absolutely certain, and if it's not 100%, without doubt, stay away, he said. So, so that's where um, I have to, I'm obliged to make that decision. I pray for me, pray for Father Pfeiffer also, that he um, makes the right decision here. Because, anyway, pray for all this, and let's ask the Holy Ghost, let's really beg the Mother of God for the great happy hour when she will step in and throw this whole mess over, and give us a Pope that will consecrate Russia as she demanded. And until Russia, until the Pope obeys the Virgin Mary, 
It's, we're going to be in continual storms and chaos and upside down until Rome comes back to Catholic tradition. So we got to do our part. We got to become saints. We got to sanctify our life. We got to strive for holiness. We got to strive for union with Christ all the time. We got to grow in charity towards God, our neighbor. We got to we got to be saints. And we must beg heaven for that great hour of our lady's victory, which she promised. It will come. And the way God style, the way the way he usually works is he pulls in in the very last second. That was the case with Judith and the, the Jews. They were surrounded by the armies of Holofern, and they were starved out. The water supply was cut, the food supply was cut. And they said, well, if God doesn't answer us in a week, in eight days or whatever, ten days, we are going to surrender to the enemy. And Judith rose up, inspired by the Holy Ghost. She said, Who are you? Who are you, man, to put limits to God? And she said, She said, um, We must pray, but I will go. And in Judith, in the last minute, God shows this beautiful woman. And the scripture says that God, when she put off her dark clothes, because she was a widow, and she put on her jewelry and all her <coughs> earrings and her hair and a huge bun <coughs> and her beautiful dress. The scripture says twice, God made her far more beautiful. And then she went over to the camp of the enemy. And uh, the long story short, she ends up being invited by the general Holofernes to the big banquet. He's, and he sees Holofernes, he's enthralled with her beauty. He's so happy he gets drunk and they drag him to his bed and she goes into the tent with him. And God inspires the great Judith. She looks up to heaven and she pulls out the knife out of her basket type of purse with her servants with her. And she says, she takes the knife while Holofern is snoring like a cow on the bed. She says, Lord, strengthen me in this hour. Strengthen me in this hour. Mm -hmm. And she cuts off the head of Holofernes. So in the last minute, God spared the Jews. And that night she made her way back to the camp. And all the Jews gathered together within the city. And, they, and she pulled out the head of Holofernes. She, she said, today God has given us victory through a woman. And that woman, Judith became the glory of Jerusalem. Her song and her victory is sung and praised forevermore. But she prefigures the role of the Virgin Mary, who will always crush the head of the devil. So again, in the last moment, God pulls through. What about when the, when the apostles were on the, uh, the Sea of Galilee and the huge storm hit with waves 30, 40 feet high? lightning striking and high winds and they felt like the boat was going to tip over and our Lord was there sleeping in the boat but as St. Gregory says he was sleeping in his body but as, but as God he, he had everything under control he knew what he was doing and they came and waked up Christ and said save us or we're going to drown and Christ rises up and he calms the storm in a moment, in an instant. So that's God's style, isn't it? Men fall, they turn from God and they become corrupt and more corrupt and everything falls apart. This has happened many times in history. And God has to come in and punish, like Sodom and Gomorrah, punish a nation, a city, or a metropolis of cities, or a whole uh, continent. He punishes and then, and then God works a revival of the faith. So this, this happens many times in the church history. And we know we're heading into a massive chastisement. We also know we're heading into a great victory of the Virgin Mary. So let's help her, uh, let, let's help her prepare for this victory by living the life of saints and the love of God that we're supposed to in our duties of state.
And that's the whole point of this Mass of the Holy Family. <coughs> the Holy Family. What must it have been to, to be among them? St. Joseph, the Virgin Mary, and the Child Jesus. And the Child Jesus, when he was born in Bethlehem, the angels pointed him out to the shepherds. They found him not in a palace of Herod, not in even a, a, a nice warm bed, in a nice warm house in Bethlehem. There wasn't any room, not even a hotel room. So no baby and no mother has a baby in a barn. It just doesn't happen. But that was the sign that God chose to be born. Born in a, in a stable at Bethlehem, wrapped in swaddling clothes, in a most humble setting, surrounded by two animals that kept, with their breath, kept him warm. And when, they, when the shepherds came and adored this mystery, this Word made flesh, they were Jews. Remember, the Jews, they were all waiting for the Messiah. They were all waiting for the true Redeemer to come. And the shepherds were chosen. It wasn't the schools of philosophy or, or the, the scriptures in the halls of the temples of Jerusalem. It was the simple shepherds who sought our Lord. And they had good hearts. And they loved our Lord. And our Lord, when they saw the angels pointing that they were chosen to see for the first time, uh, on the day of his birth, the, the Savior, the true Messiah, born, they ran with haste. And, and Saint, uh, the Saint, Saint Bede the Venerable says, <coughs> When it comes to Christ, we must run after him. We must chase after him <coughs> with all our heart, with all our desire, with all our intellect. Because the intellect seeks the truth. And we all want to know the truth. Right? Little Simon right here, when he says, when he sees things, he asks, why? Why is that car broken down? Why does the sun do this? Why do grasshoppers do that? Why this? Why that? Children do this. And we all do it. When the, when the engine's making noise, what's the cause? When uh, the oven isn't baking the bread right, <coughs> is it the ingredients that's the problem, or is it the oven? We want to know the cause. So, we want to know truth. And Jesus Christ the King, He is the truth in the flesh. He is the truth. There is no way to the Father but through Him. And no one can come to Him unless the Father draw Him. So it's grace that draws us. But we must love and seek the truth. And this is a, this is a sin and a, and a problem of the whole human race for all time. Most people really don't care. Most people are like Pilate, saying nonchalantly, well, what's truth? It's not worth getting headaches over. Just live like animals. Sleep, eat, have fun, and uh, be self-centered. But those who seek the truth, that's a special grace. And we all got to pray for this. We all got to pray for this. St. Teresa of Avila, she writes how when she was a young teenage girl, she almost got sidetracked from that love of truth. Remember, as a young girl at age five or six, she took off with one of the zealous little boys of the town. They were leaving the walls of the city of Avila to go to the Muslim countries, to go get martyred for Christ. But their uncle found them and he brought them back home. But it showed this little girl was ready to lay down her life for Christ. She wanted to die a martyr. But later, as a teenage girl, her cousins introduced her to novels, love stories. And she said it was a grace for her to stop reading this garbage. Even though back in the 1500s, I'm sure it was far more innocent than what we would have now on videos and our movies and our books. But even then, she said, had I, had I not stopped reading this, I would have gone to hell. I would have lost my vocation to be a nun, and I would have gone to hell. So, the, 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 the love of truth, this is something we all got to pray for. 
and every day pray for it, to love Jesus Christ, the truth, with all our mind, all our capacity. That means we got a thirst for true knowledge. And don't you hear that a lot in the epistles of St. Paul throughout the year? Seek the true knowledge in Jesus Christ, grow in wisdom in Jesus Christ, grow in wisdom and understanding in Jesus Christ, filled with the Holy Ghost and all understanding, all these words. <coughs> because we're not allowed to, to let our minds be filled with emptiness and just empty data, or even innocent things like just hours and hours and hours on useless information and video games. We're not allowed to fritter away our minds on trivi trivialities. But to really feed the mind with truth, love the truth. And that light comes to us through prayer and study. Prayer and study. And just reading events, just knowledge of everyday experience, everyday lives, uh, everyday disappointments, crosses, blessings. God is speaking to us through all these things. And we must pray for that wisdom of the Holy Ghost to love the truth and see everything in the light of the truth. And with our hearts to love Christ. This is also a great grace. To really love our Lord is something we got to pray for every day. And to live in the love of Christ is to live in the state of grace. It's the same thing. So that if I don't live in the state of grace, I don't love Christ. He doesn't know me either because I'm dead. My soul's dead. So we want to live always in the state of grace. And of course, should we flip and fall, come back to the Sacred Heart with contrition, sincere contrition, kiss the crucifix, and get to confession as soon as you can. So the Virgin Mary, she kept all these things in her heart. And it was St. Luke who sat next to the Virgin Mary later in his life, after Christ had ascended into heaven, St. Luke was an artist, and he was a good writer. And, he, and he, he's the one that has the most detail about the story of the manger, Bethlehem, St. Joseph, the loss of the child Jesus in the temple. Who's the one that knew in this and saw this and pondered all this in her heart? The Immaculate Heart of Mary. So it was St. Saint, Saint Luke who sat with her and wrote it all down from her mouth. And St. Luke had a talent for painting. And this is something very beautiful I've, I've just discovered recently. <clears throat> there are five famous icons painted by St. Luke that we didn't even know. I didn't. Our Lady of Perpetual Hope. St. Luke painted that icon. It's beautiful. Also the Salus Populi Romani. That's a famous icon in St. Mary Majors in Rome in the Basilica, and it's a beautiful icon of Our Lady, painted by St. Luke. Also, Our Lady of Czestochowa in Poland. Did you know that was also painted by St. Luke? Also, Our Lady of Vladimir in Ukraine, which has miracles to it, all of them do. And then there's a famous painting of, known to be by St. Luke in India. Um, Father Pankras has been there to pray before that icon before. So, five, and there's more icons also that St. Luke painted. So he not only wrote the, the Gospel of St. Luke and the Acts of the Apostles, but he also painted Our Lady. That shows the love the Apostles had for the Virgin Mary, the Mother of God. Because once our Lord has ascended into heaven, that was, that was the Mother of Christ with them. So it shows the goodness of our Lord to leave his mother with the apostles uh, all that time, for a long time, for quite a few years. So the Holy Family, when we look at St. Joseph, we see this as Pope Leo XIII said when he instituted this feast of the Holy Family. He says to the fathers, look at St. Joseph for a model. He's a model of manly virtue of obedience to God and God's will. So men must put in their families, God must be first. Daily rosary, daily prayer. Because the father is like the priest of the family. But he also has to recognize when he's raising children, he can't have the children praying 
three rosaries on their knees straight in a row, plus the litany of Our Ladies, the litany of the Sacred Heart, the litany of St. Joseph, the litany of St. Philomena. They can't torture the kids and make prayers seem a burden either. Because some good zealous fathers kind of fall into this. Uh, on the other extreme are those fathers who don't pray hardly ever, and don't never lead the rosary, never lead prayers, never teach their children the catechism and the scriptures and the faith. <coughs> so that's also, a, these two extremes must be avoided. But a good father must set the, uh, must, must teach his family, must set the good example. And a very important example, fathers must give to their children is the love and cherishing of their, of their wife. The children need to see dad loves mom and shows that love by affection and the kiss on the cheek and all that and holds her and consoles her and cheers her and, and respects her. They need to see this. It's very, very important. This this love be shown between husband and wife before the children. Not a Hollywood scene, I'm saying, but something noble and full of the love of Christ and forgiveness and praying for each other. And then Pope Leo XIII says, look at the Virgin Mary. Mothers, take her for the example. The Virgin Mary was humble and dutiful. Very dutiful. Can you imagine Our Lady missing out, preparing a meal. She made good meals for the Holy Family. And our Lord and St. Joseph worked hard. So she made good food, there's no doubt about that. The Mediterranean diet also is very, very rich and tasty. Lots of spices, lots of, lots of these kind of things with figs and dried fruit and, and the Mediterranean things, rice. But the Virgin Mary would have prepared all this with great love and diligence, and she would have kept the house as best she could in order, and the Virgin Mary would have always honored St. Joseph. We see that in the Gospels. St. Joseph says we must flee to Egypt. Our Lady doesn't fight with him. She doesn't argue with him. She knows this is the will of God. She knows the angel has spoke to him. She obeys. They both obey the will of God promptly. And and then what, another thing that shines out in the Gospels, of today's Gospel, is we see Our Lady went through, through, she went through three passion tides. Three, she went through two tridu, triduum, uh, we would say in the plural in Latin, tridua. She went through three tridua. Three, twice she went through three days of torture, extreme torture. The first, we call it the, the Passion of St. Joseph. Because when they lost the child Jesus for three days, can you imagine the anguish in St. Joseph's soul? Here, here is St. Joseph, I am responsible for Our Lady, the Mother of God, whom the angels venerate, the diamond of all creation, I am responsible for, and I am breaking her heart because I am responsible for the loss of the child Jesus. Can you imagine that weight on him? Poor St. Joseph. Of course, it wasn't his fault, but men take the fault on themselves because men are responsible. And his anguish. This was three days of the passion of St. Joseph and Our Lady. And remember, what went, what, through, through, what went through their minds? Did you mothers ever lose a child in the shopping mall or in the store or you couldn't find them in town. And you have a little taste of that anguish. But for three days, this was a torture. And Our Lady and St. Joseph knew the scriptures very well. They knew Christ would be tortured, whipped, nailed in his hands and feet, transfixed. So they didn't know when. So the Virgin Mary was thinking, is this the time? Is my son being tortured now? So that anguish of the, of the heart of Our Lady and St. Joseph's passion. So, um, so, so you mothers, <clears throat> you learn from the Virgin Mary, honor your husband. And if you need to, you know, argue or bring up objections, bring it up respectfully. Also, timing is important for wives. 
This is, this is a problem of, a cause of many problems in marriages. The wife wants the solution right now, but the husband just got home. He's dead tired. He wants a good meal and a good cold beer, maybe, or a glass of wine to calm him down. He, he, he's not ready to handle more problems at home, which he just was facing at work. So the wife needs to have that delicatesse. She has to have that supernatural tact to know when to bring the problems up to her husband. This is a very small detail, but it's important. So first, the husband come home, feed him a good meal, give him a good dessert, whatever. Have the children settle down, pray the family rosary. Then later, when he's calm, he's more relaxed, then you bring up the right timing for objections and problems and, and headaches of the family. In the scripture, the Holy Ghost warns the mothers, don't be a nagging wife. Know the time to speak and know the time to be silent. Very, very important detail. And even the scriptures, the book of Proverbs, will compare a nagging wife to a leaking roof. And men know what a headache a leaking roof is. You just can't find the cause of it, but it keeps leaking. So, good wives, and especially in these times of everyone under stress, it's the modern world, everyone's in a hurry to go nowhere, know when to speak. Know when to speak. And that also is taught in the monastic rule. St. Benedict teaches the monks, if the abbot comes in and he's angry, and he starts yelling at this his brother Procopius for, be, for breaking some the truck, getting a flat tire on the truck, let's just say. But it wasn't Brother Procopius. He wasn't the one driving. But Brother Procopius is the one being yelled at. St. Benedict says he's to kneel down and be silent and take the beating, the verbal beating, humbly. And when the anger has passed in the superior, then... Then, when he's more calm and the night, the evening has come, or the following morning, or, the, or a few days later, then Brother Procopius goes to the superior and says, Father, I just want to make clear, I wasn't the one driving the truck. And I didn't get the flat tire, but I'll try to be more careful from now on. <laughs> so you see, there's St. Benedict teaches this wisdom. And then Pope Leo XIII says, look at the child Jesus, of course, the model of all models, but the model for us proud men to learn humility and children to learn obedience and respect of their parents. Never talk back to your parents. Never be sluggish in your chores because you eat with the family, you got to share to do dishes with the family. You live in the house, you got to share with the cleanliness, keep the house clean, keep the house in order. Heat the house. Well, you're in Phoenix. You don't have these problems. But up north, the boys got to help load the wood and cut the wood without complaint to heat the house. So the children, we all learn from Christ this. This. Listen to these words of St. Bernard, speaking of Christ's humility in the manger. What is more unworthy? What more detestable? What more severely punishable than that seeing the God of heaven become a little child that man should continue his opposition to God by magnifying man over God upon the earth. This is the modern world, isn't it? And then he says, it is a mark of intolerable insolence and pride that where his majesty, our Lord Jesus Christ, has he faced himself? A poor worm should be puffed up and swollen with pride. So we need to learn, all of us, from the child Jesus, humility of heart. Humility of heart. Walk humbly, knowing that if we exalt ourselves, we will be humbled. But if we humble ourselves, we will be rewarded justly by Christ. And also, here's the words of the Virgin, about the Virgin Mary. She was comparing, about the words keeping these things in her heart, 
She was comparing in her heart the signs of deepest humility when she saw with what she knew of His Supreme Majesty the stable with heaven. So Our Lady was contemplating all this. God in a little tiny stable, a barn for animals, yet He dwells in heaven in the throne of majesty. And the swaddling clothes, she compared the swaddling clothes with the words of the prophet in Psalm 103, Christ is clothed with light as with a garment. Because in heaven He shines brighter than the sun. And yet, this God is now wrapped in swaddling clothes. And even more stunning, God is going to come down here on the altar very soon. Here, humbly on this altar, in this little home in Phoenix. <coughs> and she compared the crib with the throne of God. And the beasts, the two animals, with the seraphim. The angels of heaven who fall down before the throne of Christ. And the God, the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, singing, Santus, 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 the glory of heaven. And the Virgin Mary was in awe about all this. How can Christ, who is God and so majestic, be so humble and so simple? And that's what's most impressive and beautiful for all of us to see. Christ sitting in a little boat with St. Peter and the Apostles and sleeping, which we all do. But then He, being God, calms the storm at a moment. So that always in our Lord's life there's this combination between majesty and humility. God and man. The sublime with the, the most simple things. Healing a man with clay spit and dirt mixed and putting it on the man, uh, eyes of a man telling the blind man go wash or the crippled man go wash in the pool but he, did, he can't go in the, everybody gets there before him so Christ by his word cures his eyes so always we see this in the, in the, the church's sacred mass and the sacraments are just like this a simple washing of water over a baby's head, the most sublime action takes place, which is a washing away of original sin, and that soul filled with the Blessed Trinity and His soul by sanctifying grace. This is the union of the most sublime and the most simple, water and the power of God. Same with the oils and the sacraments. Same with the words of the sacrifice of the Mass. The words of Christ turn this bread and this wine into the very body, blood, soul and divinity of God Himself so we, we like the Virgin Mary we've got to live in this supernatural reality of things and change our daily duties the daily duties chores of every day what the modern world calls the, the daily grind or the, the humdrum of daily life to be bored and, and sickened with but not in Our Lady. We learn in Our Lady, the daily grind is sacred. Everything we do is good. And we've got to do it out of love for God. The monk's life and the nun's life is every day pretty much the same thing. But they learn to grow in the love of God and offer every single action out of love for God. And that's what we've got to learn from the Holy Family. St. Joseph and Our Lady and, of course, the Child Jesus. So let's pray to the Mother of God, pray to the Holy Family, that our families re reflect this, this charity of Christ. And we're in, a, we're in an age that's destroying the family, of course, with divorce laws that were brought in by the spineless Catholic bishops who refused to oppose this in Argentina, in the Valais in Switzerland, in the United States, and in Spain, and in Ireland, all these Catholic countries that were Catholic, and even not Catholic, it was the Catholic bishops who had they stood up against all this, the divorce laws would never have been passed. The abortion laws would never have been passed. So it's the cowardice of the Catholic people and bishops, mainly the bishops. So let's pray God will give us good Catholic priests and good Catholic bishops 
who hold the line of Archbishop Lefebvre. And don't fall to false compromise, nor to a false sedevicantism or schismatism. Just hold the line of Catholic tradition until Rome comes back to tradition. This, will, this is what Archbishop Lefebvre said so many times. And he said, there's nothing, we have to warn our faithful, the greatest danger for the faithful is to come under the modernist bishops. And that's what's happening now in the new SSPX, sad to say. Sad to say, but it's happening. All the priests now have to go to the local diocesan bishop for the, to get the marriages approved. Now, these, do these bishops believe in the indissolubility of marriage? Do they believe in the new code of canon law that reverts the ends of marriage? Of course they do. How, how can we... They don't even have the right doctrine on marriage. So this is what's happening. So this is why we have to stay the course. Stay in this fidelity, in this fight to tradition until Our Lady steps in. And may she, the Mother of God, the con conquistadora, the conqueress over heresy and modernism and Freemasonry and Judeo-Masonry, may she come quickly and overthrow this one world order of Satan and restore the kingdom of her divine Son, which is promised, and she's going to do it. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. O Mary conceived without sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.